Fourth of July weekend, 2010, is when my whole life changed. I'm gonna share that story with you. So I was uh, born in Portland, Oregon, uh, raised in Washington State uh, in the US. I was raised in a, a Christian home. We were a Lutheran family. We, we went to church on a regular basis, Wednesdays, Sundays, evenings, you name it. We were in the church building. It was very much a part of our lives culturally, but I had never actually met Jesus. I was religious by culture. My process of coming to know the Lord um, is a long one, and it actually starts with my sister denying the faith. I have an older sister, she's two years older than me. In high school, she begins to question uh, her faith and the faith of our family chooses to uh, not identify as a Christian and instead pursue other things, pursuing Buddhism, pursuing the occult, spirituality, all, all different things. And she begins to practice these other faiths in our house. And when that happened, stuff started happening in the house that no one could explain. I remember actually some very keen memories of waking up in the middle of the night and you're thirsty and you're trying to you know, go get a glass of milk and then feeling like someone was following me around the house. And I would turn around to see who was there and there wouldn't be anyone there. But I would have this, this feeling of, of fear that someone was right there behind me and was, was going to get me. I wouldn't know till many years later why that, that was the case. But the more my sister practiced these things, the more strange things happened in our home. Uh, she ends up uh, uh, being diagnosed with some mental illness, chooses to go to university. For, for me and my family, it was sort of like, oh, that funny sister is, uh, is finally out of the house. I'm pursuing a life just like anyone else. So I rejected the faith when I was in high school, went off to college, and I lived a life just to gratify all my desires, anything that, that I wanted, any thing that I took pleasure in, I, I just pursued after it. So for me, it was relationships with, with women. It was pornography, it was drinking and partying, it was pride, wanting to be successful. I was a, a college uh, track athlete. And so that was my whole life and I really had no desire to find anything else. And so I felt like I really had everything, but then at the same time, I didn't. And the more I pursued this lifestyle, the, the, the more I was pulled down, the, the more I felt uh, empty in my heart and, and wanting to, to fill myself up and to get the things that I wanted thinking it would make it all better. And it was actually at the lowest point of my life. I, I got a phone call from my sister. And this is the same sister that everyone thought kind of went crazy. And she calls me and says, Greg, I've, I've met Jesus. And, and I was taken aback. Like, wh what do you mean you, you met Jesus? I, I know the struggles in your life, the things that you have pursued. You were adamant uh, against the, the, the church. You pursued all these other faiths. You struggle with mental illness, all, all these things. And what do you mean you met Jesus? And so she told me her story of, of uh, pursuing the things she was pursuing, meeting a friend who introduced her to a local church. And there at the local church, entering into a, somewhat of a counseling relationship with one of the pastors there. And that pastor was able to explain the gospel, was able to talk to her and help her process things in her life. And what ended up happening is they, that pastor identified that there were spirits at work inside of my sister that was not the Lord. And over the course of, of several meetings and several months and through prayer and, and all these things, she ends up being delivered from all these spirits. I, I believe six spirits were cast out of her. And when they were cast out, she came back into her right mind. A lot of the things that she had struggled with, uh, the depression or really radical mood swings, whatever it was, left. And, and she's explaining this to me, that the pastor told her the gospel. And, and after she was delivered, the pastor explained that it was Jesus who set her free from all these things. It was Jesus who transformed her life, delivered her, and has now provided a way for her to be saved, to be forgiven, to be new. And I'm just sitting there on the phone and felt confused by the story. I was frustrated that my sister, who I once thought was kind of crazy, but in a different way, right? Now about the gospel, I just didn't know what to do with it. And then she said, Jesus wants to introduce himself to you. Uh, for me, that was a line that was crossed. I didn't want to meet Jesus. I, I wanted to continue running after women. I wanted to continue doing the things that I was doing. I, I didn't want to give up my life. I loved my life. And so when she said that Jesus wants to meet me, that... That was not good news for me. But my sister actually continued to pursue me. She loved me. She sent me messages on my phone. She would call me. She would encourage me. She would tell me that Jesus is real. The gospel is real, that he really does want to meet you. And whenever you're ready, Jesus will come and he'll introduce himself to you and you can meet him and have an opportunity to come into his kingdom. Again, this 
this language is weird to me at the time, but she was very consistent at it. About a year goes by and we're coming up to 4th of July weekend. This was, the year was 2010 and my family was doing a typical celebration. And then my sister shows up. That was crazy because she lived in California. So she drove over 10 hours to come to this family holiday. And she says, I came because God told me to come because I think that he wants me to pray with you and that he wants to introduce himself to you now. And I was like, I don't know what to do. I mean, this is a year, a year of her pursuing me, a year of her telling me all these things. And, and, and now she's here and I kind of felt cornered. And it was funny actually the way that she did it. I was actually had a plate of food and I was going through the food line and she comes up and says, oh, Greg, I'm, I'm supposed to pray with you. I was kind of mad at her. Like, what do you mean do you want to take time to pray? Like, we're here to celebrate the 4th of July. I just want to eat my cheeseburger and eat my chips and watch fireworks later tonight and just be left alone. And, and she said, Jesus wants to meet you and, and he's sent me here so that that could happen. And, you know, I actually told her yes. And, and I, I sort of did it, I think, just to get her to leave me alone. Because I didn't believe that God was real or that if he was real, that he obviously didn't care about me. And so I thought, okay, what's, what's two minutes? She'll pray for two minutes, nothing will happen, and then I'll move on with my life. And so I agreed to it. And we, we went down to a quiet place and we, we sat down and my sister says, I'm going to start praying. So I said, okay, and just kind of sat there quietly. And, you know, I didn't really know what to expect. Now, I was raised in the Lutheran church. And so praying to me was, you know, a, a written prayer, maybe the Lord's prayer, maybe, maybe something else. So I was kind of waiting for her to, to pull it out and start reading. And she didn't. She, she laid hands on me and, and she closed her eyes and she just started praying. And I was so confused because I didn't understand anything that she was saying. And the more that I listened to her, the more that I realized she's not speaking any, she's not speaking English. She, she's speaking something else. And it doesn't sound like really anything that I've ever heard before. She's just sort of speaking gibberish, but she's very, she's very serious about it. I'm looking at my sister. She's praying for me with her eyes closed and it's just this kind of awkward scene. And then I start getting angry and I don't want to be there anymore and I, I want to leave. And I, I kind of try to get up and go and I, I can't move. I'm just sort of stuck, but it doesn't make any sense. Why, why would I be stuck? No one was touching me other than my sister's hand on me. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big guy. I'm, I'm over 6'4", you know, 220 pounds. And yet I, I can't move. And, and so I just sit there and my sister's praying. And so I close my eyes and I can't understand what she's saying, but I knew the language that she was speaking. I mean, it was the same sensation. Like if you're sitting in the airport and the person next to you is speaking Russian on the phone, you don't speak Russian, but when you hear it, you know what it is. That was my experience. And I'm beginning to hear that she's speaking a real language or, and then I know what language it is. She's speaking Hebrew, modern Hebrew. And, and I was so shocked because I mean, I know my sister. I know never studied Hebrew before. How is she praying in a language that she has never learned before? That, that does not make sense. And I, I begin to kind of feel afraid. And then as I feel afraid, I begin to feel a presence in the room that I had never felt before in my life. And it was this mix of, of like beauty and perfection. At the same time, I felt fear. I felt sort of naked, sort of unclean, sort of like I shouldn't be in this presence. That, that's, that's how I felt. And, and it was funny at that moment that I'm having this experience, my sister stops praying, looks at me and says, oh, Jesus has come. <laughs> it's like, what? She's like, Jesus is here. He's here in the room. And, and you are encountering his presence and you don't know what to do and you feel afraid. She was actually describing the way that I was feeling and I hadn't communicated the way I was feeling. And she says, Greg, it's okay. He's here because he is the Lord. He loves you. He died for your sin. He is here because he wants to get to know you. He wants to offer you life. He wants to know you. He wants you to believe him. He wants you to surrender everything to him and follow him. That's why he is showing himself to you. And I said, well, okay, uh, well, what do you want to do next? You know, and she said, I think we're supposed to keep praying. And so this time, you know, she closed her eyes and hands on to me and I closed my eyes and I just begin now what I know is praying 
God, is this real? Is this really you? Are you actually real? And so I am praying these questions, these seeking questions. And my sister is praying. She's praying again in tongues, Hebrew. I'm seeking now what's real. And again, the presence of God comes. And again, I feel this weird blend of like perfection and righteousness and yet justice and uncleanliness and unrighteousness. Dirty is how I felt all at the same time. And then I just was like immediately start weeping and I start saying out loud, I know you're here, but I'm too dirty for you. I, I'm too dirty to be in your presence. And my sister's just continuing to pray and I'm encountering the spirit. And in my spirit, I hear him say, I am Jesus. I, I am here for you. I died for you. I get to determine what is clean and unclean. And because of what I have done, because of my sacrifice, I will make you clean. You are clean, clean to me if you surrender your life to me. And like I, I heard him. I heard him in my heart. I heard the gospel in my heart. And I remember just saying out loud, okay, okay. And I'm in tears and I'm just, I'm saying, okay, okay, God, just, just, just take my life. And I, I felt his peace come. I mean, immediately I felt his peace. And I, I felt joy and I knew that he was there. But my sister is still praying, you know, like, like she knows something else is going to happen. And as she's praying, I start to smell just a bad smell. It's sort of like rotten eggs or like um, even like methane gas. And I still have my eyes closed, but in my spirit, I can begin to see there's these people coming. I, I, I know now that they're fallen, they were fallen angels, but but this one in particular was very, very tall and he comes slowly into the room and he's sort of standing in the doorway. It wasn't a normal doorway. It was kind of one of those wider, taller doorways that separates a kitchen to a living room. And he is so tall, the back of his shoulders is higher than, than the crossbeam at the top of the door. And I can see his shape and you know, he's wearing dark covered robes but, uh, but I see him there and it's this funny feeling of like I should be afraid of you but I'm not afraid of you and not only that but I know who you are like I'm familiar with this this fallen angel and, and at first I didn't feel any fear but then he begins to like approach me and he's he's sticking out his hands and he grabs me and he starts shaking me and I can hear him speaking he's angry and he's saying Greg is mine he's mine he has served me he has followed me he loves me you cannot take him you cannot have him he is mine and at that point I, I felt fear I, I felt like he was going to take me away and and that Jesus wasn't done yet that, that I wasn't really Jesus this demon this fallen angel is going to be able to take me away and I grab my sister's hand and I yell out and say don't let him have me don't let him take me away and my sister, without, without oh, I'm taking a moment, just turned, opened her eyes, and I, I have my eyes open at this point, and she rebukes this demon and says, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Get out. You cannot have him. He is the Lord. He is bought by the blood of the Lamb. You have no rights to him. Leave now in Jesus' name. And then he left. <laughs> and it was like this... this crazy moment where I encountered now for the first time in my life that battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. And it, and it was like not a battle. It was like the enemy had no more power. And as soon as the name of Jesus was spoken, that fallen angel, that demon knew that there's nothing that he could do, that he was, he was powerless. His, his power was made empty by the cross is what we read in the scripture. And I hadn't even read that scripture yet, but I encountered it. I encountered this demon fleeing at the name of Jesus. And I, I still kind of had this fear in me. And my, my sister just perceiving what was happening, just turned and said, you need more of the Lord's presence. And did, didn't even give me a moment to ask questions. I mean, she didn't quote scripture to me. She didn't explain theology to me. She said, you need God's power. She laid her hands on me, said, receive the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. And then it was just like, boom, the Holy Spirit came upon me like fire on top. I remember I had that fear that was in my heart. As the Holy Spirit comes upon me, the fear is like draining out through my feet. The Holy Spirit is coming in and I go from being afraid, like I'm gonna be snatched out of Jesus' hand to being a secure child of God. And the transformation from fear to peace 
Anxiety to stillness in his presence, to joy, was immediate. And I still remember to this day what it felt to be consumed with the love of God, to be consumed with his joy, that I knew now that I'm his. And I knew that because of what he did for me, that I was secure in him, that he would guard me, he would protect me, he would mature me, he would help me. I had his presence in me. And my sisters took a little time to explain what had, what had happened, and, and I started asking questions. My life is changing, what, what do I do? And, and she said, you need to read your Bible, um, you need to start praying, start talking to, to Jesus, and then take time to listen, he'll speak back to you. And, and then get yourself plugged into a, a Bible-believing community, a community of believers that are following Jesus who can help you, who can help you grow, who can disciple you. That's, that's what you need to do. And, and she said, you know, I want to pray one more time, and I think God wants to speak to you about what he wants to do in your life. Later, my sister lays his hands on me, begins praying in the spirit again, begins singing in the spirit, and then begins prophesying to my heart and saying, in the name of Jesus, God is going to use your story. He is going to move you around to different places. He's going to lead you to different people, and you're going to be able to share this story. God's going to use your story to strengthen the church, and he's going to use your story to bring people, to bring seekers who don't know Jesus into his kingdom. But you have to trust him. You have to follow him. He's going to help you. He's going to equip you. And then it ended. We went back to our 4th of July celebration, and this whole time I am now watching fireworks. I will never forget that day. And, you know, I went back to normal life. Now I knew Jesus. I knew God. I just pray all the time. And now I've been following him, you know, for 13 years. Now, you know, I'm a pastor, and I've been able to serve him and use my story all through the United States and even other countries abroad, uh, Asia and now in Europe. And 